all you have done um, for our city and our community. And today is my two year work of Rosalie. <laughs> everything um, that Monzo is doing and coming together as a community. And I'm so excited to hear what Mayor Becky has to share with us because I think we're in a really great place. And I just appreciate all of you being here. So with that, um, let's thank Appearances Marketing and Promotion for sponsoring today's luncheon. Chamber and the city for the opportunity for appearances to be here and our wonderful team and our incredible clients. Thank you for that. It's customary to talk about the business in this minute in time, but you know, today I feel much more compelled to talk about my city. And I'd love to talk to you about our business, and anyone on the team would be happy to talk to us. You know, we always have the best snacks, so come on by anytime and we'll visit with you. Um, you know, Moscow is my hometown, and I would not have anything I have without it. And I say it's my hometown, and if my snarky little brothers were here, they would be saying, no, 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 you came to Moscow later in life. Well, I was two, <laughs> so I'm not really appreciative of their constant later in life comments, but Kara Best, you know those Gritman babies. They just own it, and they own it forever, and they tell you forever, if you weren't born at Gritman, you're not local. So I you know, try to care enough for Gritman that I hope I've earned local, so here we go. So the city of Moscow is shaped who I am as a person in more ways than I could possibly say. So I'm just going to say two things. Uh, my very first job was with the city of Moscow. I was 13 years old. I signed an actual contract. Anyone in human resources probably having a heart attack, but please remember it was the 60s. Um, so I was a park aide at East City Park and worked with children. And at that moment in time, that gave me confidence I would have never had. And together, Elizabeth and I have built a company that employs people of all ages, even old people. <laughs> so, you know, we start with high school students, and one of them, the beautiful Madeline Johnson, is here with us today. There are many more I could run through. Um, we have second generation interns uh, uh, with Adina and McKinsey. The list goes on forever. I thank you to the city of Moscow for giving a kid a chance, and it's inspired me to give others a chance, and it really uh, makes a difference. And it's how you can own a business in Moscow is by understanding the talent that's in your community and lifting it up. So another time my city gave me a wonderful opportunity was my senior year in high school. And I was had the great privilege of being a page at the legislature. And I was about a month in when I was asked to do something that made me really uncomfortable. And I knew that the right answer wasn't going to make me A, popular, or B, understood, and that I would be misunderstood. So I called my great advisor, of course, my father. And I got him on the phone, and I said, this is what happened. And he says, Donna, you're a Moscow girl, pride of the North. You know the right thing to do. And in the long of things, you really will understand that it's the difficult decisions that define you. And I've carried that with me, and it's been resonating particularly in my head, as it has all of yours, I know, since that sad day, November 13th. And if you would join me, I would really feel that our most appropriate thing today is to give thanks for our city, and particularly our police department, for doing the right thing and the hard thing. We are the pride of the North. Thank you. 
you, everyone. Um, I'm gonna wait for Dre to come up and tell you about all the super fun things happening at the Moscow Chamber of Commerce and Visitor Center until we're done, so that we have something to look forward to after our tax conversation. Um, and, you know, take some of the pressure off of you guys. And um, thank you all so much. Without further ado, Thank you, Sam. <laughs> she knows what she's doing. Okay. And there we are. Okay, great. So thank you all for showing up to hear this. I'll try to bring you up to date on all things that have gone on in the last year that are worthy of note and provide a new perspective on what's coming up in the future. So, hence the state of the city. As Donna just said, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that we hit some very rough times in November all the way through December 30th. And I think that despite the tragedy, the horror of it all, we did get some good out of it. It highlights the relationship between the city and the university and also the way our police force works not only by themselves, but with the state patrol and the FBI as well, to begin bringing this case to a conclusion. So good for the other entities that are involved, and good for the city for staying steadfast and carrying on through the, all of this. The city government uh, is composed of the mayor of the city council. You know who I am. I'm up there on the left-hand side. Uh, we have six city councilors, two of whom, uh, Haley and Sandra are here someplace, uh, are our city councilors. We did swap out one councilor toward the end of the year. Anne Zavala retired, sort of, more like uh, went on to other occupations in Japan, for heaven's sake. And uh, she was replaced by Drew Davis, who will serve to the end of the term. And uh, we have elections coming up in November. There are new elections. And uh, that seat will be up for grabs, as well as three others that will be then going for the full term. Well, I guess three seats all together, but yeah. So anybody interested in becoming a city council member, here's your opportunity. So think about running. Everybody says Idaho is growing at a rapid clip, and that applies to everybody. Well, Idaho is growing, and growing fairly rapidly. Uh, you can see we're placing number two on the list behind Florida at 1.82%. Uh, Moscow has seen some ups and downs, as you can see on the chart on the right. Uh, we swing back and forth a little bit, uh, partly because of the COVID business and the impact that's had on faculty, students, and some residents. But overall, we've had a little bit of a surge this last year. We don't know quite what this year's going to look like until we get the numbers out of the census department sometime this summer, but I suspect it will be headed up again. Overall, we average a sedate 1% growth per year since, well, time immemorial, really. And that means, at the moment, about 250 more people per year move into town. Unfortunately, when you get 250 people moving into town, each and every one, this means that at an average of two and a half people per residence, you're going to need 100 new <coughs> residential units. And as you can see on here, the blue dotted line is multi-family residential dwelling units, and the green line is single family homes. We're lagging behind ever since the Great Recession back in 2008-9. We've not built, building enough houses, and this creates a shortage, a deficit in supply of housing, and that's manifested in higher prices and a general lack, which hinders a lot of things, including uh, bringing people to town who are in their career days. Uh, for example, uh, the university has occasional difficulties bringing on new faculty because there's no place for them to get a house. So we need to get some more housing developed. We have uh, some new annexations, some new subdivisions. Well, housing doesn't happen overnight. It takes a little while, so we're hoping by this summer and into next year, there'll be more housing available, and it could be faster if we had more contractors who were able to actually build houses, and that would be good. But then why are all these people 
coming into Moscow. We live in a beautiful, beautiful area, and it's very attractive for a lot of people for a lot of reasons. We aren't hugely metropolitan, but you can get there from here. Portland's about six hours, Seattle about five, Spokane an hour and a half. You can get off to the major metropolitan areas when you want to, but we have a surprisingly quiet, college-oriented lifestyle here that is very appealing for a lot of people. You can see here we offer a lot of amenities to our citizens. It's a great place to live. 93% of the citizens in the recent survey said it was an excellent or good place to live. And some of the breakdown of that is over here on the side. The green line is a place to raise children, really high. The blue line, a great place to live. And on a big upward trend, is, is Moscow a great place to retire? Yes, it is. We offer a college atmosphere with arts, entertainment, uh, social and cultural activities of all kinds. Moscow is a good place to come. And more reasons to be here are the things that are put on by our arts department, our events department. We have things like the Vandal Town Block Party. We got the Art Walk, Light Up the Season Parade, Moscoberfest, and just recently Winterfest. And of course, Farmer's Market. Always a big draw, about 10,000 people per Saturday throughout the season for Farmer's Market. These are big draws. Farmer's Market uh, is number one in Idaho, maybe faded to number two this year, but we'd like to bring it back to number one in places in the top 10 or so nationally. Really good farmer's market, and we treasure that, and it is an amenity for this town that you have. I'd like to move on and kind of cover what happened in 2022 briefly. So first thing up was we passed a $10 million bond, we being the citizens with a 67% vote, passed a $10 million bond to construct a new police station. And thank goodness we did. I don't know how many in here have been through the old police station and seen its decrepitude and crampness. Uh, if you really want to get an inside picture, go ask Chief Fry over there, and he'll tell you how cramped it was. So we constructed the new facility, and it came in very handy because it demonstrated its flexibility and its utility through the recent unhappy events where we put in a whole lot of other people and it could accommodate them, which could not otherwise have happened. We got the bond passed. It was advertised to be at 2.2% for the bond. However, when it all was said and done, we got it for 1.26% interest, which I don't think will ever be seen again on the <laughs> bond. <laughs> So in other words, uh, if you look at it through a certain lens, we're making money and borrowing that money. Worked out well. Another case where it was an extension of the bond was also to renovate the man building over here in City Hall's parking lot. And I'm sure you've all seen that catastrophe of a building. Concrete blocks that had cracks, water was getting into the cracks, and you know what happens when freeze thaw happens on concrete blocks. The place was not doing well. Uh, partially a victim of deferred maintenance, which is another word of saying we don't have the money to fix it. So as part of the bond, we did fix the man building and re renovated it for at least another 30 some good years of use. And this is what we have now. It looks better, it functions better, it's better insulated, the roof doesn't leak, good stuff. So. It's much cheaper to look after your facilities and uh, the things you do than it is to try to replace them after they break. Um, so anyway, that was another part of the bond that benefited from the citizens voting for it. Also recently, the blue ice rink has opened up. Uh, it's a huge, enormous sheet of ice. I don't know if you've been in to look, but I highly recommend it. Go in and have a look at that thing. Better yet, go in and skate on it. It's a great facility. The city provided a million dollars from the Hamilton Fund to assist in development of this facility. Uh, it's been attracting tournaments. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had uh, several, six or seven visiting teams in town filling up hotel rooms, patronizing restaurants, and generally availing themselves of all the services and amenities that Moscow has. This is really a nice facility and uh, we should be very proud of it, and we appreciate the work that went into it on the part of the Palouse Ice Rink Board and everybody who helped participate to bring it to fruition. 
Also, everybody's favorite, out on Mountain View, we put in a traffic circle. And uh, thank goodness it is open, and that it opened before the snow flew. So it's very good. It takes a little sharper turn to navigate compared to the Joseph Street one, which is more of a chicane than it is a roundabout. But this one, I have noticed that some people enjoy uh, in the larger pickup trucks, freelancing and going straight across. Forget the turn, we're just right through. So, yeah. oh, they don't do that part. There's big rocks up there, it'll yeah. gut a truck. But around the edges, they sneak through. Uh, as an extension of that, uh, we've also done work on some of our downtown streets, uh, 6th Street, 3rd Street, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've enhanced the lighting through there for safety reasons, and also to make it look better. Got rid of the old gooseneck street lights, put in decorative street lighting, brick pavers, a nice sidewalk, and coming this summer, uh, these overhead lines are gonna be disappearing and be undergrounded as well, and pull up the wooden poles that support them, and clean up the look of those areas quite a lot, make it look a little more urban, a little more downtown. Down at D and Mountain View, we also did a safety project. We got a grant for $250,000 to help with this project. When that area was without stop signs, you could still sail through on Mountain View without having to stop. And that meant that a left turn lane made sense. Well, after the stop signs went up for the safety of the students, why have left turn lanes anymore? It didn't make sense. So in the interest of student safety, we pushed the sidewalks in closer, narrowed it down to just two lanes, which makes it easier for the crossing guards and provides some good uh, cues to the students who are crossing back and forth there. So that was a major uh, undertaking. It didn't take too long. And uh, I don't know if you really noticed that the sidewalks there are now bigger than what they were. We also got the idea that we would uh, extend sewer and water surfaces down South Main. As we all know, ITD is building the four-lane US 95 coming into town from down there. And uh, rather than extend services after that fact, tear up perfectly good new asphalt to install sewer and water, we did it now. We extend services beyond that intersection down to facilitate development in that area, and also to help out Schweitzer Engineering and their new building and other things like that. And I don't know if you can see on this, but in this central picture, you can see here's the grade level. And to get things to flow, there's some guys down here who are 20 or 25 feet down. There was a big, big trench that had to be constructed there to enable the services to work properly. So that took a little bit of time. I think they discovered at one point an old buried car along the banks of the Blues River. <laughs> and so these little unexpected bits you find underneath, you know, nobody ever finds gold here, but they can find it in cars. Tragic. But anyway, that's extended in the interest of uh, not tearing up a perfectly good road soon after it's installed. Also, we continue with the street maintenance program, uh, not necessarily street improvement per se, but we focus on maintenance and continuing the utility of our streets for as long as possibly possible. To tear up the street and put down a full layer of new gravel and asphalt is ungodly expensive. Tyler Palmer, over here, our public works guy, can tell you just how much that is. It makes more sense to try to maintain the roads and keep them going for as long as possible. And one of the ways to do that is this rubberized chip seal which is not like normal chip seal, which merely propagates any cracks. And you can see here are all these alligators. It just propagates that back up. The rubberized coating is more flexible, and therefore, when you put it down, the cracks don't propagate upwards. You've extended the life of that chunk of road by five to seven years. So we do a lot of this around town, just not necessarily to invest in whole new roads, but to perpetuate the utility of the roads that we do have. Yeah, this one. This is out at the city shop, and few people ever go out to the city shop. The city shop is about 60 years old, and so is this building. This picture of the old building that is being replaced, it houses one of our uh, city wells. And the picture doesn't show it, but uh, this is standing upwind. You can't see it from the side, but that poor building 
It was developing a definite downwind tilt and was not long for the world. So we replaced that and uh, put in a backup generator, not without cost, it was about $830,000 to do that, but that assures that water can still flow during power blackouts and it will still go because the shed around it is not collapsing on top of the wellhead. <laughs> Never a good thing to be had. So that's another one of the major projects that's gone on pretty much out of sight and therefore out of everybody's mind. ARPA funds, the city council put together a project to take some of the ARPA monies from the federal government and disseminate among small businesses and nonprofits who've been adversely affected by COVID. So all of these businesses, all of these nonprofits uh, got a pretty good chunk of change to keep them going and help them continue with their business and their mission. Also, we contributed in $120,000 to help with the construction of affordable housing in town. Everybody here who has a house knows that if you had to buy it now, maybe, maybe not, probably not, it's expensive. So construction of affordable, and I prefer calling it workforce housing, to keep people who work at some of the jobs that keep us all going, keep them closer to town so they don't have to pay for gas to commute in from much more distant places. And so we'd like to see more workforce housing constructed in the future. The downside of that is that the city is not a developer. The city does not build houses. All we can do is zone and assist in how to get the project to move forward. It's up to developers to actually do the heavy lifting to construct those houses. And recently, we put together the Climate Action Plan. This is a plan that pertains only to the city and city services with the idea that we would like to set an example for the community at large to follow things like uh, wise scaping yards to reduce the amount of water that goes in, uh, contemplation of alternative vehicles uh, like electrics to replace the internal combustion engines. The city is slowly replacing its in-town fleet of internal combustion engine vehicles with electric. And that goes to another point I'm going to make here in a minute where we'll need charging stations to accommodate those. But it does reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, electric vehicles cost less to maintain, and we would love to have those in-house. So part of the Climate Reduction Plan involves all of that and more, and it's online if you want to go read about it and check into it. But also remember, we're not forcing anything off on the citizens at large. This is for the way the city does its job with the hopes of setting an example for everyone else. Downtown, poor downtown, uh, it's a success. It's a victim of its own success because the infrastructure that went in way back in 1981 is now 42 years old. And as anybody who is starting to reach their mid-40s knows, things ain't working the way they used to. <laughs> Same thing here. It's difficult to see, but you can see the condition of some of the curves here. Some of it's getting pretty chewed up. Everybody knows the aggregate sidewalks are uh, getting a little ragged as well. So we're putting together a plan in conjunction with community input to try to upgrade downtown, to bring downtown back. We get a lot of visitors from out of town. This is Boise. And when people come into town into an urban environment, they have certain expectations anymore of how your downtown should look. We want our main street to be as good or better than this and promote the use of downtown as a nice environment in which to go where you don't have to worry about tripping on a curve or something like that. So we're working on that in conjunction with the developer, well not developer, but the architects and the community taking those ideas and trying to put them together into some kind of a coherent and reasonably affordable option. Uh, replacing hardscape is dreadfully expensive so this is clearly going to be a phased project where it goes bit by bit by bit as funding becomes available. But at the moment, uh, the ideas are coalescing around let's work on the Friendship Square area first and then branch out up and down Main Street from there, which will eventually encompass from about 7th Street all the way up to A or thereabouts. So that's what we would like to get done there. 
uh, below south of 7th Street. That was done as part of the Gritman project, so that's already in fairly good shape. Now we have to work north, but starting with Friendship Square, because that is a focal point for all of our community activities. The Winterfest, Oktoberfest, uh, Vandal Town Block Party, Farmers Market, and so on. Also, we're going to need some more infrastructure improvement. Take a lesson from our friends down in the valley in Lewiston. They did um, deferred maintenance for a great many years, which was popular with the voters because they didn't get hit with 2 to 5 percent increases on a regular basis. Well, the EPA caught up with them, and now they're due to replace the entire infrastructure that they got there to the tune of something like $50 million and right now. So, Think about the unhappy ratepayers when that happens. For us, we've got about $30 million to do over the next decade. And so we've been saving and projecting these costs for years, uh, saving up the money that we need to execute these things. If you don't do them, the EPA gets a hold of you and they levy fines to the tune of $37,000 per day per violation. And so when you think about that kind of impact on the city's finances, and when I say city's finances here, I mean citizens. You guys who are actually out there paying the taxes. If a $37,000 fine comes in, the city doesn't really pay it, the citizens do. So we're trying to stay ahead of that by plotting, planning, and uh, doing what we can to keep the facility both up to EPA standards. We all want to keep the pollution down and be good citizens and stewards of the environment. But at the same time, uh, make sure that when the handle on the toilet flushes, it goes away and you don't have to think about it. <laughs> Fire department. Uh, we've been buying new vehicles as the old ones age out. Uh, we got a hold of a grant thanks to our wizard grant writer, Elisa Anderson. And <laughs> and so we were able to get this fire truck among others, we've already got two new ones replacing the old ones. Uh, they were still operative, but you can't get spare parts for them after 20 years. So what do you do? Well, generally, one of the others that was replaced, I think we sold it to Genesee for a dollar. So it's, they still have some utility, but uh, it doesn't do you much good to have a fire in them if the pump busts in the middle of an incident. Uh, we've had a couple of structure fires, and the volunteers who showed up put them out. And that's just in the past couple of weeks, so good on them. But our job is to supply these. We've got another truck coming this spring. And in a couple or three years, we need to replace the ladder truck to the tune of about $1.8 million that we split with the university. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> also, the volunteers themselves need to get big kudos and gold stars. These are the guys that actually answer the calls. These are the guys that show up on probably what is one of your worst days of your life. So they show up for the EMT purpose, they show up for the fire. And recently, we had a ceremony where we spoke to awards for life-saving, CPR that was successful, three of those, extrication of a person who was stuck in an apartment, unconscious while the apartment filled up with smoke. So we had an award ceremony for that, and we thank the citizens who called that one in to get there in time. So anyway, our volunteers are the basis of what we do there. We train, and what we need are actually more volunteers for both EMT and specifically paramedic status. And we also would like to have more in-town, long-term resident residents, volunteers as well, who can come in and help anchor the facilities and services that we all need. Current and upcoming projects, yeah. This is what's going to happen to you come summertime, I think. There we go. Go back. Okay. So, we've got a bunch of stuff coming on this summer. Uh, Indian Hills and Ponderosa booster stations, these are the pumps that provide sufficient pressure to uh, allow for fire flow through the city pipes. So, we have to do those. Those are expensive little beasties at $3.9 million apiece. Uh, we have the water system transmission improvements to get from the wells to the storage tanks. We need to replace those pipes, lest they burst on us in a most unfortunate time. 
sewer main improvements, believe it or not, underneath our streets, we still have some clay sewer pipes from way, way, way back when that need to be replaced. And that's one of those critical services the city provides that we need to work on. Uh, the Lily Street's gonna get torn up pretty good for a complete rebuild uh, from the pipes under all the way to the asphalt on top. So that's gonna get done this summer too. Don't drive on Lily Street, you won't be able to. And Paradise Path lighting uh, along the stretch of Paradise Path behind Identity along the creek. We're putting in lights to improve the safety and visibility through that stretch. And so the conduit is already there. We just need to put the bollards, the light, and wires in. And that's coming up this summer too. Our other favorite project, the bridge at Sixth Street. <laughs> The bridge that kept with each flood event getting narrower and narrower. I don't know if you noticed, but the Jersey barriers started out pretty far, and they kept creeping in. Every time we had a flood, the Jersey barriers came in closer and closer. Well, clearly, time to replace the bridge. It got off to a late start. There were some other issues, but it should be done April, May-ish, somewhere in there. And then everybody can learn to drive through the roundabout, once again, with another spoke of the roundabout coming in. So. Uh, enjoy the learning curve that everybody's going to go through on that. The airport, it proceeds. You can watch the progress of the airport coming up by going to flytuw.com. They've got live webcams, and you can look right down at the construction site and see what's going on. It's coming up out of the ground, the, what you would call almost a daylight basement, which houses the service vehicles, the TSA screen, things like that. Uh, are down in that section. And they're just about getting ready to put the floor for the actual terminal on the top. And it is due to be substantially complete by December 31st of this year. It doesn't mean it will open right then, but soon after it will, and we'll have a genuine airport where people aren't wedged into the post-security waiting room, cheek by jowl, <laughs> and hoping please let them on the airplane. There's more space in there than there is in this waiting room. So. It's on its way, it's doing well. The total cost, uh, last we heard, was about 71 million, but the terminal itself is only a fraction of that. The rest of it goes into the areas out here where the planes are, to put in enough concrete to hold the 737 without watching it sink slowly back into the pools. <laughs> also had to put in a very large tank to hold the icing fluid. EPA objects to dumping this propylene glycol right out the back door. So there were a lot of considerations and a lot of infrastructure, parking lots, power, all kinds of things that go along with this. So the terminal itself was only a fraction of all of this. Challenges, there's always challenges going forward. The biggest long-term existential challenge that our city has is where do we find alternative water? We're still pumping out of the ground down in our two aquifers, the city pumps almost 100% from the Grand Ronde aquifer. And so we would like to keep that aquifer stabilized, and that means finding an alternative. Uh, we're working with PBAC, the city of Pullman, University of Idaho, Washington State University, to find solutions to this. And whatever we do is going to be plenty expensive. But we have to start now in order to get it done by the time we get there. Uh, fire and EMS, I already spoke to that. More volunteers, please, if you have a hankering ride in vehicles with lights and sirens. Mm -hmm. is your opportunity. Jump on it. We're replacing the emergency radio system. Uh, right now there's deficiencies in that system that cause blackout areas in town, blackout areas in buildings. And if you're a fireman going into a fire and you're outside the radio reception, your life is definitely in peril. So we're working on this project, also expensive, about $3.8 million, to completely redo our radio network in the area. And so that should be moving along, should be done by the end of 24. And the shop facilities, they're all 60, 70 year old out there. And as we move forward with new uh, climate action designated plans to put in electric vehicles, we need to change the way the shops work. We need to put in charging stations. There's work to be done out there. Currently, the people that work out there are standing on top of each other trying to get work done. And it's not effective, it's not efficient, and it hinders the city doing the best job that it can. So we want to get that moving forward as well. 
Okay, I'd like to end up with one more discussion on the issue of property tax. Everybody who's opened their tax document this year has had a swoon just about. I took a look at it and gasped. And what in the world? I don't like that. Okay, property taxes. Out of every dollar of property tax you pay, Moscow gets about 30% of it. So we get $3 out of every dollar that goes in. You look at the bill, the rest of it goes elsewhere. Laytaw County gets 23%, Moscow School District 36%, and the rest is divvied up between the Highway District, Cemetery District, Library District, and they all get their little bit. So uh, these figures include any levies or bonds that have also been assessed. So the cities includes your property tax base plus the payback for the police station bond. Uh, the school district has its additional levy as well. Yep, down button. Thank you. There we go. Okay, so historically, property taxes have been pretty much a 50-50 proposition between commercial and residential. But over the past few years, this has swung dramatically to 75% residential, 25% commercial. And so why is this? Uh, in 2021, if you had a $350,000 house, okay, this year, in one year, it jumped up about 40% to almost $500,000. That increment between 350 and 500 is what you're paying your additional tax on. Moscow levies its taxes based on dollars in last year's budget. 3% is the maximum we can take compared to last year's budget. And that amounts to 62 bucks. Five bucks per $500,000 house per year. Five dollars a month. But if we hadn't taken anything, if we'd taken zero property tax increase, the taxes still would have gone up by 270 297,000. And so 297 plus the 60, that's your total tax bill now, because we did take that 3% to try to deal with inflation, which hits cities just like it does everything else out there. So with that, uh, that's where some of the tax is coming from. Wrong way. Wrong way again. There you go. So what do we got here? Where's, where are the taxes going? After you paid your taxes and your extra $62, you look across the larger landscape. The total assessed value of town divided by the number of tax increases that we put in, and that's your rate. Rate times the value of your house that's not exempt from taxes is what you pay. Well. The state hasn't changed the homeowner's deduction a quit for some years. It's not indexed to inflation. It's not indexed to assessed value. So that most part of that big increase you saw from your $350,000 house to your $500,000 house is what you're paying taxes on. However, what that implies is the commercial rates have gone down. So fast food restaurant uh, in the city of Moscow, that's uh, about $400 less. Uh, local retail store, $450 bucks less. Most interestingly, a large apartment complex in Moscow uh, got a tax break of 7,700 bucks. Uh, your single family residence that we were talking about uh, went up 350 bucks. And when you multiply that by the other taxing entities, the school district, uh, the county, uh, the total tax bill is on this side there. So that apartment complex is paying almost $26,000 fewer than what they were last year. However, that poor owner of the now $500,000 house is paying almost 1200 bucks more. And that's what's going on with property taxes. This is not the city driving you to your knees and uh, reducing you to thin gruel for dinner. This is a legislature thing where if they increase the homeowner's deduction, a lot of that will go away. The income tax receipts that we've been getting back, courtesy of the government, have been a delight, but 75 bucks a head, eh, not a big deal. It disappears in the noise. 
But if they took that money and used it to reduce property taxes, we'd all be further ahead. And to compare ourselves to other municipalities, there we are at 750 uh, is 7.5 million is the total return we get in the city, and that includes the million bucks that we get from the bond for the police station. So really, 6.8 million more or less is what the city runs on. Down the hill in Lewiston, uh, they've got about 30% more people, but they've got 300% more tax revenue coming in. And this is because of the way the tax system was set up in 1978, where they took the value of what was going on in these towns back in 1978, and it's been stuck there ever since, despite clear changes in the way cities have done business. So overall, uh, every city in this state is different in what they get for taxes based a lot on that 1978 thing and the amounts that we could charge after that. Um, it, there are 6.8 million that we receive in tax revenue for property taxes does not even fund the police department. The police department costs us about 7.2 million. So by having a police department, the city is already 400,000 in the hole at the outset. So we're kind of also unique in that a lot of our valuation is exempt from taxation. So we can only tax on what's legally allowed to be assessed. So the university is off the tax rolls. Uh, churches, schools, government buildings, off the rolls. So really what we've got is a town that's worth uh, three and a half billion or something. Over half of that is off the rolls. So we're trying to run a city with less than half of the money that we really need to run it properly. Other cities don't necessarily have this problem, but frankly I think having the university pretty much offsets the issues there. But still, having some more money would be really handy. So anyway, Mostly what we need to do is get our legislative people to equalize residential and commercial property tax and bring things a little more back into shape and uh, not treat cities as pariahs and leeches on the flesh of the citizens all the time. So we need to change that idea around a little bit. Anyway, that's all I have. Uh, so any questions, I'm going to try to answer them. But if you have really difficult questions, uh, we have Haley right there and <laughs> Sam. So hit them with the tough stuff. I'm liking it already. No questions. Great. So, oh, Louise, as always. Hi, Louise. So we've uh, revised our uh, strategic plan with the major challenge areas. We did that this last fall and reoriented uh, the projects in order that we would like to see them addressed. Some have gone away because we've actually done them. And we've popped some new ones on. And I won't even try to name them. You saw some of them up there in the challenge area section. And there's a whole list more of them that are category, categorized as Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, of order of the importance in which they need to be addressed. Most of these are also not one-offs. They're ongoing, uh, several year long projects. that are large in scope and can't be uh, as neatly remedied as uh, uh, repaving D and Mountain View for student safety. So uh, they're online, you can go check them out. So I. So if you want some reading at bedtime that will help you pass <laughs> gently to sleep, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> so, good, Sam, come rescue me. Um, to make this such a wonderful place to live.
Um, and also, if we could give Wilder Catering a round of applause for the delicious peppers. Um, okay, and without further ado, I'm going to run through some announcements. Oh, hi everybody. My name is Dre Harmon. I'm the <laughs> Director of Tourism and Marketing at the Moscow Chamber of Commerce and Visitor Center. And um, typically at these luncheons, we do open up the floor for announcements. Due to time today, we're not going to do that. Um, but you're all welcome back at our next luncheon featuring our law enforcement offices, um, and that will be on March 22nd. Um, and if you haven't already RSVP, you can contact Sarah Tucker at our office to do so. Um, hi, Sarah. <laughs> um, some other chamber events that are coming up. We have our call with the legislators today at 4 p.m. Um, we really encourage our businesses to tune into these. It's a great opportunity to get FaceTime with your legislators during the legislative session. Um, and if, you know, we can't speak for all of you, right? There's a very diverse group of businesses, a very diverse group of needs. So this is your opportunity to get that FaceTime um, with them and let them know uh, what legislation you support, what legislation you're concerned about. Um, and we can't uh, thank you all enough for showing up to those conversations. Um, also, throughout the rest of February, um, I want to highlight the Blues Cult Film Revival, which is an amazing film festival every Wednesday at the Kenworthy. Um, which the Moscow Chamber of Commerce and Visitor Center is highlighting. Um, I also want to point out that on Thursday, Napoleon Dynamite is playing, and our members' festival dance have a dance component plan. It's sponsored by Inland Northwest. And it is sponsored by Inland Northwest. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, other announcements. Art Walk is tomorrow. The City of Moscow does an amazing job of hosting Art Walk monthly. Um, I think a lot of you probably remember this used to be a annual event that is now um, almost every month throughout the year. Um, we'll be hosting um, food from Wilder Catering again in our lobby, along with artwork from Justin Miller Photography, who does really amazing um, landscape photography of the Palouse. So we encourage you to check that out, um, along with all of the amazing Art Walk locations across town. Um, let's see. And then lastly, I just want to thank everyone who made it out to Winterfest on February 4th. Um, it was Moscow's most holy rad 80s themed opera ski party. Um, and we had 800 um, wristbands sold, which means that's 800 people who were drinking um, craft beer and beverages out on Main Street. Um, we've been working with uh, University of Idaho Extension to do an economic contribution study. And so they've had, and they do this at the farmer's market as well, um, they had counters throughout the event. And we found out that we actually had 4,000 people downtown on February 4th. And so. It has been incredible to watch the use of the entertainment district grow and to get to have an integral, integral role in that. Um, and as you can tell, these events are so much more than just you know having our open container laws lifted. They're about bringing your family downtown to enjoy activities, uh, for businesses to connect with community. It's really the true definition of what brings commerce and community together. Um, one last announcement before we... Um, I'll make you all do a drum roll with me and we'll draw a winner. Um, but I just want to let you guys know we enjoy hanging out with you so much that we have a weekend coming up in June where we have our annual chamber auction and Camp Moscowana. So please mark your calendars for June 2nd and 3rd. We can't wait to spend so much time with you. It's going to be great. Um, okay, and without any further ado, um, if everyone could join me in a drum roll.